Hello, I'm your host, Brian Wagner, a licensed professional engineer. And in this episode of the Engineering Quality Control Podcast, I am excited to walk down memory road with you and revisit the top 10 quality engineering control podcast episodes since the inception of this podcast. We'll delve into the insights, discussions, and the valuable takeaways from these episodes. As I look back on this journey so far, it's been amazing to see how much that we have learned and grown together as a community of professional engineers seeking to produce the highest quality work that we can, whether it's been working independently or with your firm, but then also in collaboration and working with others across various disciplines, including architecture, inspections, and construction. The shared experiences and expertise that our guests have brought to the table have been undeniably broadened my own understanding and perspectives on this subject, and no doubt have helped our listeners greatly. Furthermore, I do mention that we do say goodbye for the season and want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you for your unwavering support and engagement. Your feedback and suggestions have been instrumental in the craft of this podcast, making it better through our own experiences. And although we will be taking a break for a few months, I can assure you that we will be back with even more exciting episodes and thought-provoking discussion in the future. But now, let's jump right in to this episode today. Starting off in 10th place, episode 15 featured a conversation with Eric Williamson, the author of the book, How to Work with Jerks, Getting Stuff Done with People You Can't Stand. We talked about how engineering professionals can work alongside difficult people at their firms and how engineering leaders can motivate and retain their staff to continue getting the maximum productivity out of them. Let's hear what he had to say. And one of the things I truly realized is that the more of a jerk I became, the more I allowed my ego to become my amigo, the more isolated I was. And so I really had to learn fast how to break that isolation because I needed them. I needed people, you know, I needed their, their consult, you know, I needed their advice, you know, I needed their help on all different types of things. So some things that we, what we can do in order to work better with jerks or not even become one, um, there's a few things. You know, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll mention, um, and this is for leaders too, leaders and, um, you know, engineering leaders and um, professional engineers, you can definitely benefit from this. Um, for engineering leaders specifically though, one thing that I think is inherent for them to do is to create a safe environment, create an environment where engineers love to innovate. They can ask questions. They can challenge the status quo, let their voice be heard. And you can do that by understanding what people value and what drives them. And so if I were working with an engineering company right now, one of the first things I would do is I would do this core values exercise. So that one, that way everyone understands what they value and why, what drives them to do certain things. Because once you understand that, now you know the perspective and you know how to dive into a conversation. You know how to treat those challenging situations where there's conflict. Coming in at number nine, episode 12 is where I talked with Stephen Rinks, PMP, PE, and Director of Engineering at American Surveying and Engineering. On episode 12, we talked about quality control on transportation projects and how some challenges that you might deal with on large transportation projects. We talked about how you must fine tune your quality plan to suit every project and how you should continuously revise it. Let's listen to the great piece of advice from Stephen about producing high quality documents. We work on a lot of projects and what happens is that you may not necessarily uh, fine tune your uh, quality plan to that specific project. Uh, there may be some things you want to take out, uh, some things you want to add. So I want to say it, it needs to be uh, revised uh, continuously and, and constantly to the particular project that, that you're working on, Brian. Right. And I think that's important is recognizing the recognizing how important it is to be specific for because we work on so many different jobs. Yeah, it's the same maybe discipline or the same type of job, but there's no two jobs that are the same. And there's no Correct. project Correct. that will ever be the same. I mean, right. architects can maybe put a building on the same lot twice, but 
but odds are the utility connections aren't even going to be in the same places. It, Drainage it, is definitely not going to be the same. It, it, exactly, exactly. At number eight, episode nine featured this discussion with Sharon Day, an architect and senior associate with GWWO Architects, about quality control in the construction phase of projects and about planning that takes place in the design phase. Let's hear what she had to say about this. Whether it's during a quality control review or if I was taking this project over into construction, um, what's your, the biggest thing you're looking for? It's like, what's the scope? First, you got to just gotta get the general, what are we doing here kind of a thing um, to get a handle on the, the sheer size and, and scope of things. But then also you're trying to really look for um, any special details or areas that that we're kind of most concerned about. The, the general stuff where it's just, you know, general wall construction, things like that, you know, those things are pretty common and you get used to seeing those things, but you also then want to pay attention to what's, uh, what's special about this project. Uh, did we have an area of concern during design where we were trying to, you know, cram 10 pounds of things in a, in a five pound bag kind of a thing? Um, and just being aware of those things to try to identify uh, where questions may come up um, and, and what you're looking for uh, during construction. In seventh place, episode 16, where I talked with Andrew Bennett, regional vice president at Pannoni Associates, about quality control on projects and how he has maintained consistent project quality across his teams and projects. Here's a short clip from Andrew on how standardizing quality items is important at their firm. We standardized a multidisciplinary proposal because as you, as you kind of alluded to, when you're in land development, you kind of tend to be the umbrella. You know, you're, you're not only doing your particular aspect of the job, but you have survey involved, you can have transportation involved, you can have geotech involved. And we want to have one proposal where all these entities have their base language in there. So again, they're not reinventing the wheel. It's much more, it's a very large document. I think it's about 35 pages. It's more about taking things out than trying to think of things you might have forgotten to put things in. So we have that standardized and then it all looks the same, you know, from each discipline as they put their, give us their input, it all looks the same. We have a limited service agreement, which we use as almost like a PO kind of document. It's a one page thing that goes with one page up to about $15,000. You should be able to describe the scope in bullets and it shouldn't be, there should be no ambiguity. It should be really clear. We're going to set five pins on this property, that kind of thing. It's usually one discipline. And then we attach terms and conditions and fees and stuff, but it's, it's a very clean way to get uh, information to a client. And then we have a process uh, and we have reports that look the same. So it doesn't really matter, well, at least formatting wise, it doesn't really matter what discipline is creating the report. They should look and feel like a Pannonia report. Episode seven claimed the sixth spot in our conversation with Wayne Martin about his experience working for a large firms with ISO 9001 certification, what it is and why it's important. So let's hear what he had to say about the ISO certifications. Uh, ISO 9001 um, is a definitely a good program. It is basically a uh, check and balance process, uh, quality assurance, quality control, um, which is essentially a process where there's um, someone's doing the work and then someone's reviewing the work and ensuring that there's those checks and balances are uh, crossed off for not only the personal uh, engineering side, but the product itself and the client and the public. So it's definitely a good process to have in hand. Um, and if you follow it um, as required, it should eliminate a lot of the uh, miscellaneous errors. Um, we, we call them errors and omissions in our particular field. Uh, so the, the goal is to kind of minimize that as much as possible by having a third party that doesn't have any experience or understanding of a project to review that project and get the proper review and signatures uh, prior to uh, submitting that deliverable to your client. At number five, episode 11, where I talked with Raymond Gradwell, about quality control and management of project proposals, contracts, and specifications. Got away from the plans and really looked at the paperwork in this episode. Ray provided some great tips on producing high quality project proposals. 
So let's hear what he had to say. We really use a lot of blue beam in blue beam review sessions. Um, those are basically plan markups um, sessions where we, we have every, every engineering in, in, in my group has a, a, a license to blue beam. And a lot of our clients actually like the blue beam review sessions um, with respect to plan reviews and QC checks. Um, so we use those pretty, pretty extensively. We, we use some, some agencies like the, you know, three colors, the, the, the red, uh, the, the green and the blue, basically markup review sessions to, you know, to identify the comment and the, the comment response and how the comment was addressed. So we use the blue beam has been a, a great tool for, you know, how not the QC checks of, of documents. In fourth place, episode eight featured a discussion with Karen Burlingame, an architect and principal at Grimm and Parker Architects. We talked about how architecture and engineering interact and influence each other and the systems that they have established for quality control across their large firm. This is what she had to say. So um, our approach is based on um, three things, sort of doing it right the first time, never make the same mistake twice, and two heads are better than one. Uh, so we've developed a pretty detailed uh, quality control manual that includes um, our sort of process and procedures, as well as a lot of detailed checklists, a pretty detailed coordination checklist so we can coordinate between disciplines. Um, we've also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've developed um, standard templates and standard details as a way of sort of embedding good practice and knowledge into the documents from the get-go. And then we also have a project guidelines manual that sort of assist in the management part of the project. And then um, we also conduct sort of a monthly lessons learned session where we can uh, share knowledge across studios and those lessons learned sort of work their way back into our standard details and into the QC checklist. Taking the third spot was episode 22 with Lakivia Jackson, 2014 Black Engineer of the Year and Quality Manager at Morantinson. We talked about quality document management and how the use of logs, checklists, and mock-ups are used at her firm to manage it. Mock-ups are really good about, um, about seeing if it, if, if it really works because we've looked at it in 2D, it worked. We looked at it in 3D, it worked. Now, when we actually try, try to go build it, does it, does it work? So a lot of times um, you, you use that to kind of see that or, or even a test to see if the product can withstand what you know, the intent was. Um, or if you're wanted to kind of go, you know, see different ways of what it might look like. Um, and a mock-up can be, you know, it can be like, it, mock-up can be different sizes. It can be like a real huge mock-up that's like a, a little mini building, or it could be just something that is like, a, you know, like a two, two by two. Um, just kind of cut out, because I know I did one on like a, a, a little mini roof mock-up. So um, we just kind of did that in a little small scale. So that that was kind of kind of cool to do that. Um, but mockups are really good, also to, for like workmanship. I think my favorite thing about mockups that sometimes people might not always think about is when you have changes in personnel. It's really good once you do your safety orientation and say, oh, okay, here let's have a quality orientation and let's go look at all the mockups that pertain to your scope of work and then see if you have any questions or if we need to um, refer back to like the mock-up report where we've documented each step of um, the installation just to make sure that you, you know, you understand this because. At number two of the most listened episodes of the Engineering Quality Control Podcast was episode number 10, where I talked with Jason McCool, a licensed professional engineer and project engineer at Robbins Engineering. We talked about the hidden cost of copy and paste and how it can very much negatively affect your productivity at work. So let's hear what he had to say on how engineers can avoid falling into these traps. Having a second set of eyes, uh, whether that's a, a colleague or uh, 
one thing I would actually suggest is kind of an intergenerational review. You know, we tend to think of the more experienced engineer reviewing, but I would suggest it. you can also benefit from having uh, the young engineers or interns look over the drawings of the more experienced engineers because it's, it's kind of a two-way process for them. They have a chance to see how somebody experienced is doing it and learn from it. But then you also tell them, I want you to think critically through this and ask any questions, A, so you can learn, and B, because you're bringing a whole different perspective to it. You're not coming to it with the, I've been doing this for 20 years. I already know what works. I, I proved that 10 years ago. Uh, you know, I, I did that calc 10 years ago. I'm, I, I know, you know, and it, well, maybe, maybe things have changed. Maybe the code's changed. Uh, maybe this new engineer has uh, been exposed to some things now, you know, that, that you weren't. And so uh, I think that can be helpful. Finally, our most listened to episode of the first 29 episodes of the Engineering Quality Control Podcast. The number one most downloaded and listened to episode was episode 18, where I talked about the differences between quality assurance and quality control and how management and expectations play a role in defining these terms at your firm. So here's a quick look at the differences between the two. That quality assurance is essentially the management end of things, the oversight strategy. How are we verifying and what systems have we put into place that can be repeated and applied to each deliverable, each project, each process that we do in our company? Alternatively, quality control is the strategy of executing those expectations and applying them to the specific aspects of each project. And why so the question comes up is we, we hear about QA, QC or, or, oh, it's quality assurance or is it quality control? But really the, the end game is getting to that finish line of exactly meeting an expectation. So I think of what I think of as quality assurance, and that is that foundation, maybe that's the, the corporate expectations. This is what you're going to do. And I think of it as like a foundation. Quality assurance is that system that we base how we approach quality control. And every company is going to be a little bit different. Every company and every firm, even firms within the same disciplines, can easily be very different because of jurisdictional requirements and all those things that we've I've talked about in the, the gather phase of my five-part framework that really can affect how you approach quality and those expectations that are defined both by your clients, by the approval authorities, by mandates and laws and codes versus just guidelines and policies. As we wrap up this season and take a break for only a few months, we want to express again our gratitude to our listeners and the guests for their continued support and contributions to our community professional engineering. Please remember that you can find the show notes for this episode and all episodes at engineeringqualitycontrol.com. There you'll find a summary of the points that we've discussed, as well as links to all the previous episodes that we referenced today. So until next time, friends, stay tuned and keep striving to produce the best work that you possibly can. Mm -hmm.